Well, welcome aboard. Thanks for taking the time to uh, talk to us today. Um, just so everybody understands, Wendy uh, is a three-time LPGA Tour winner and Evian Masters champion. Um, and you played over 25 years on tour from Australia. Um, came over here as a, as a, as a young and kind of skipped the school route and, and turned professional and, uh, kind of made your own way. Yeah, I came, I came out when I was 21 and just came here to play golf and ended up hanging out on the mini tours for a while before I got my, uh, LPGA card, played some in Europe and America, Asia, Australia, and then, uh, I got my tour card and that was history. Just ended up staying here. <laughs> awesome. So um, through that process, as a 20-year-old wanting to play professional golf, what was the learning curve for you uh, in doing that? Uh, I mean, looking back on it, um, it, it was just I had a mindset that I was just going to play golf. That was it. There was nothing going to start stand in my way. I never really saw any roadblocks. I didn't have any money, but I never thought about not having any money. You know, I didn't have anywhere to live or I didn't have a car, but I never thought about it. Um, but just all I thought about was playing golf and figuring out how to win golf tournament. That was, that was all I thought about. And that's kind of what happened. So Knowing what I know now, would I do it the same way? I don't know. I mean, I think, a, a I was oblivious to everything, everything everybody else knew because I was, you know, from from Australia and I hadn't been on the college scene and I heard people talk about how hard it is or what you need to do. I just figured that that's what I wanted to do and I did it. <laughs> right. So you, 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 the driving factor for you was that was your goal, ultimate goal. Um, from a from a day to day standpoint, did you? kind of have a structured way of going about it did it just you kind of just figured it out as you went did um how did that all work for you yeah uh, i figured it out as i went but i had a lot of good people on my team i mean i i've been fortunate enough to be around some of the best people in the business and you know both psychologically and technically and you know uh, just personal growth people just you know and everybody if you ask enough questions, you figure out what you need to do, right? So you have to be a leader. If you if you want to play professional golf, you got to be a leader, and you got to lead yourself. And what happens in leading yourself, you just have to ask a lot of different people a lot of questions, and then figure out what you need to do, and just keep your mindset on where you want to go. Um, you know, day to day, it was just waking up and the only question I need to answer is how was I going to get better today? I mean, that was the only question I had every day when I got out of bed. Well, I think you know? that you, you hit the nail. I think if you want to be successful with, with anything that we do, I think it's um, it's finding that how am I going to get better every day, uh, surrounding yourself with good people. Um, so expanding on that a little bit more, asking good questions, how would you go about having good questions to ask so asking good questions is uh it's about number one recognize where you are so for example if i'm not driving the ball as well as i want to drive it um you know i got to ask myself okay so where's my miss why am i missing it what what things happen and what leads up to that if i'm only hitting eight fairways and it's just asking myself good questions and then finding an expert in the area that you want to get an answer for, right? So for me at the time, uh, early in my career, there was a guy by the name of Ross Herbert. He would, you know, I'd figure out what was going on, then we'd kind of go back and forth and figure out a solution, right? Uh, Gary Gilchrist was another one. Uh, David Ledbetter was in my career. Uh, Andrew Park. Uh, Mike Adams. Brett McCabe. I mean, there's all sorts of people and, and you just got to figure out, everybody's got an opinion and you've just got to figure out how to find your own answer by asking enough questions to get an answer. Oh, that, that was brilliant uh, right there as far as 
as as a coach, we can only guide you in the right direction, but as a player, you still have to have some self discovery and kind of still dig it out of the dirt, as you want to call it. Um, but you still have to dig deep to find that answer uh, to be, to be successful and, and to know what's going to work for you and what's not going to work for you. I mean, it, it's it ha- golf's autonomous. Okay, a, co- a coaches, you know, as coaches. Uh, like when I transitioned from playing to coaching, I went and sorted out the best teachers in the world and went and watched them teach. And I asked a lot of that kind of questions. And, and you know, you just have to find out an expert in, in wherever you're at. Like if it's your putting or if it's your short game or if it's, you know, it might be just a bunker shot. You know, just go and ask enough questions and you'll figure out how to do it. Awesome. So, so it leads into an, another good question here for you. Going from playing to coaching, um, did you kind of have to change your mindset a little bit from being a, a player and focusing on yourself to trying to find the, the answers for other players? So the difference between being a player and a coach is a player really only needs one solution. Like, as a player, I only need to know what I, I have to do to execute the shot I'm trying to hit, right? And there may be six other six people I can ask their opinions, and they might all have a different opinion, but I have to pick one. The difference between being a player and a coach is, as a coach, I've got to be the one that has all the options. So, the player can, so when a player comes to me and they say, um... In this situation, this happens, and I've noticed it, and then it's my job to give four, five, six options for them to go and try, and then to own whichever option they choose to put under pressure. So I've gone from not caring too much about what other people think because I only needed to find one solution to wanting to have more and more and more solutions so I can touch more and more people and help them you know, enjoy their golf. Now for you, do you have, uh, can you still separate that being a player uh, from having all the solutions to knowing the one that works best for you? Yeah. It took a while though. Uh, I will say that it did take a while. It took me a couple, three years probably after switching from being a player to a coach because as a player, the mindset is I want to try this and figure out what works, right? And then as a coach, you learn all these new things and I want to try everything because I'm a player, right? In right. my mindset at that time, I still haven't transitioned into what I really wanted to do yet. But, and it, it takes time to, to test all that to find out what is going to, to work best for you in, in the heat of the moment under pressure uh, at the same time. Yeah, and I mean, awareness is the key. I mean, every... I don't know who's going to be watching this, but you know, if you're if you're a college player or a junior player, or the tour player, I mean, you have the solutions inside you, but you just have to be aware enough to ask the right questions when things go sideways, because they will. Things go sideways, and the only person that really knows why it goes sideways is you. But then you've got to have a bunch of people on your team that you can ask good questions of, so you can find the answer to why it goes sideways right right um so so going forward with that can you tell me more about how you would prepare for a tournament um regular tournament compared to a major would it be the same would you change your routine would you um throughout the season would things change a lot for you or would you try to stick to kind of stick to the basics and and keep on the same routines So I don't know that uh, when I played that I really knew as much as I do now um, as far as preparation is concerned. I think I know way more about preparation now. Uh, But what I did do is I wanted to make sure I was rested at a major. I wanted to make sure that I wasn't getting to the major trying to fix my golf swing, trying to work on something new, uh, that's not the place to do that. You know, I would always go and see my coach two, three weeks before a major. I never wanted my coach out of tournament. I, I don't get why people want their coaches out of tournament. 
uh, to me that just doesn't make any sense at all because if me as a coach, if I've done my job, my player is autonomous and they know how to perform and they're going to make mistakes. I can't fix any mistakes that week, you know. Right. And as right. a player, well, having a coach there, all as a player, we're always asking questions of our coach and we kind of subconsciously rely on our coaches, right? Mm-hmm. And it's not a good week to do that either as a, at a major. So I was always kind of looking forward to two or three weeks prior to a major, I would go and do whatever work I needed to get done and then just whatever processes I put in place, I would just do that all the way through and then evaluate after that week. Right. Okay. Uh, and would that change for regular tournaments throughout the year um, for you? I, my, um, my physical preparation was very similar. It didn't matter what week it was. Mm-hmm. Like I would do I, – I was – pretty much on the clockwork. I would do this at six o'clock on a Tuesday morning every week. I would do my laundry at this time on a Monday every week. I would travel at this time. So, I mean, I I play my practice rounds at a certain time. And, you know, as far as the physical routine, it's just the mental routine uh, that sometimes changes because we we go in ebbs and flows, right? Some, Some weeks we feel super fresh, some weeks we feel tired. So, you have to figure out how much time you can devote to working on something and balance that with making sure that your your mind is sharp. If you don't play a practice round and you've got a sharp mind on the first tournament round, well, you're better off not playing a practice round, mm. right? Um, knowing the golf course, if you have a caddy, for example, caddy's job is to know the golf course. So as a player, you know, I was always able to you know, give that responsibility to the caddy and, and trust the caddy that he, he would be prepared for whatever happened on the golf course, um, he or she. And then, I don't know, my, a lot of my, everything went into like eating well, exercising. Um, I never drank when I played tournament golf and, you know, all of those things, everything, I woke up and it was seven days a week. Everything was trying to make sure my body felt the best I could every week. That was pretty much what it was. And then I'd take a week off if I was tired. And then even if it didn't have a scheduled week off and I was tired, I would, I would go home. Right. Well, for, from, a, from a coaching standpoint, dealing with uh, high school players or, or juniors that want to play college golf, I think you just gave them a lot of information on – if they wanted to play golf in college, it's going to be similar to your routine, but they have school, but it's going to be having a plan, getting the schedule, sticking to the schedule if they want to be successful and compete and, and separate themselves from the rest of the college players in the field or in, in their conference for that matter. Um, and then that's just building their building their routines for playing professional golf after school if that's something they, they wish to do. a while to figure out what works for you um, and, but it just takes trial and error and you can't just try something for one day the, the thing is you have to give yourself a I, I always liked a three month window because I, I felt like three months was a good test of how I felt at the end of three months did I feel fresh if I felt fresh well great what I did work if I didn't uh, obviously something wasn't working I'd have to adjust something for the next three months right Mm-hmm. Um, and that's week to week as well. You know, everybody has responsibilities, and especially if you're, you know, in high school or or, or in college, you know, you have to. You're going to have commitments that you need to put first. Okay, the, the things that you need to do to uh, get good grades. All right, so you don't have a choice. So that has to come number one, always. Sure. And then sure. you have to. Attend uh, when your coach tells you to be at the golf course, you've got to be at the golf course. So, obviously, if the coach tells you to be at the golf course at a time that you've already scheduled to study, well, you need to you know, figure out what your priorities are, and then you're just going to have to take some time from somewhere else. Um, but a schedule is like super important, structure is super important. People that say they don't have enough time or they get behind or it's just simply not not knowing what you need to do, having a list of the things that you need to do and just figure out how to fit it all in. It's that simple. Right. 
and you're gonna be busy. Yeah, you. If you, if you right, if you, you do it get right. Good at golf, if you want to get good at golf, you're gonna be busy. Because every every sleeping, every waking moment, you're gonna be making sure you get your stuff done. Yeah, and, I, and er, er, as you said earlier, you kind of broke it down in uh, four or five segments of your body, your technique, uh, some performance, some short game, whatever buckets you may want to choose to call it or put them in. Um, you want to spend time in each of those buckets, and sometimes more buckets going to need more time than another bucket. Right. I think um, Dustin Johnson's a, a great example of uh, buckets because he just – made a decision a few years back that he wanted to be one of the best wedge players in the world and look what he did, right? right? So that that would be an example of a bucket, you know. But not he he figured out a plan and he executed the plan and then the plan worked in a year, right? It didn't happen right, right away. So you have to work a plan to get a result. Yeah, and I would. And and since you've been coaching more, you're from a coach's standpoint, it's kind of frustrating to have an average golfer, a weekend golfer, uh, someone that maybe didn't play at a higher level in college, get really frustrated and not seeing results. Um, not they haven't put enough. They haven't given enough time yet to let it start working, or even had the time to put the reps in. To, before they play around in the weekend, one week's not going to change your bad habits you've had for a while, or movement patterns, or things that's keeping you from scoring better. Right. Well, so people, human, we we have tendencies, right? And when we're on the golf course, everything goes sideways for one reason: is we try and fix it. Right? Something happens and we try and fix it when we're on the golf course. That's when your brain goes into a sideways pattern and you can't get out of it, right? Mm -hmm. So frustration comes from knowing, not knowing what to do and unmet expectations. It's the only place frustration comes from. So to absolve yourself from frustration, it's, it's, a, it's a really simple solution. You just have to figure out, for example, on the tee box, what is your process? It might be one thing, it might be three things. Like, my process on the tee box is very simple. I decide what shape I want to hit. I decide where I want to start it. I see the ball taking off. I walk in, I aim, I get comfortable, and I hit it. Right? But I do that same process every single time. What happens when we get frustrated is that we don't maintain that process. So, for example, if I get uh, excited or frustrated or something, instead of walking in, aiming, getting comfortable and hitting it, I might walk in and try and get comfortable before I aim the club face because my mind is, is not clear. And it's just you have to be completely aware of what you're thinking and it takes a conscious effort to be able to maintain that same process. All right, and... You know, these days, I don't play much golf anymore. Like, I don't play much tournament golf anymore, but I do a lot of, uh, I do a lot of things with my customers, and I think that there's more pressure on me to hit a good shot when I've got 15 people watching me that I'm, I'm coaching than there is standing on the first tee of a major, right? Right. So I have to go through those processes every time. So if I'm hitting an eight on, if I'm doing a, 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 an example of something, I'll walk in and it, I have to go through in my mind what is my process before I walk in and hit the shot. Otherwise, it goes sideways. So it's, it, for, for, a junior, for anybody who wants to get better at golf, you just have to figure out for you what are the three things, just three, what are the three things you want to do to execute? Walk in, aim, get the ball, look at the target, hit it, whatever it is. I don't care what it is. But I need to, and also you, you know, you've got to be sensory based when you're over the ball. Um, Pia, Pia Nielsen and Lynn Marriott kind of have made good examples of that uh, in the Vision 54 program and, you know, working on your senses and, and being aware and, and trying to shut off the analytical mind. Um, but the, the reality of it is 
if you're thinking about it, you're not going to execute consistently. That's just reality. I mean, you can use tennis as a good example. Tennis is a great example. If, those, if, if, if you've got a ball coming at, back at you at 120 miles an hour and you're thinking about how you're going to take the racket back to return it, right, the, the ball's gone before you even take the racket back, right? Right, right. The processes that relieve frustration and tension and anxiety and all of those things is just you understanding what you need to do for yourself and, and practicing that. You know, it, there's no point going to the range and just hit, 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 and then go on the golf course and expect to perform because you're not going to. Not do it consistently, at least. You know, if you're going to go to the range and you want to work on your technique, fine. Just do five balls technique and then five balls on your process. Right. Just transferring a skill to you want to perform. Yeah, the difference in going from the range to the first tee, right? That's the process. The process is entirely the difference. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It's the only thing that changes, and it doesn't matter if you're a 100 shooter or a 60 shooter. It's the same thing. Right. So for you, what would be? You go through your process, and you don't pull the shot off. Then what happens? Um, after that? Uh, okay, so I'm on a par three. Uh, I make a decision, right? So I've decided I'm going to hit a 150 shot. I'm going to start it here. I make all of that. I take my club out of the bag, walk in, execute the way I know how to execute. The ball doesn't go where I want it to go. We've got to be objective, right? So if the ball, for me, I'm a right-hander, so if the ball goes left, oh, I went left. The ball goes right, I went right. right. I'm not going to hit it where I want to hit it every time. But I know one thing for sure is that I cannot fix that because it's in the past. And it does not mean that the next shot isn't going to go where I want it to go if I stick with my process because the process allows me to hit more good shots it does prevent hitting good shots. Right. A good protest allows you to hit more good shots. So, so the way I'm going to take that is, if you're on the practice tee and you can't hit shots, kind of go in the right direction, the direction you wish it to go or the ball to curve, it's probably not going to work on the golf course no matter what. But if you can do that on the range, practice tee, or in fun rounds of golf, we'll call it even, put some pressure on it, your process is going to be the glue that allows you to succeed for four or five hours and be more successful on the golf course. 100%. 100%. The process, so some people, I mean, everybody's different, right? Some people right. get too serious when they get to the golf course and other people kind of quit, right? It's You just got to figure out who you are and what you do, right? And then, but the same process or the same preparation I made a commitment to the shot is what is going to allow you to hit more good shots. I mean, the rest of it is I've got to be committed to what I'm doing. I can't stand up over the ball thinking, oh, man, is this a 7-iron or is this an 8-iron, right? Right. We all do that all the time, right? People do that all the time. So that's not committed, right? So you back off. But if you make a good commitment and you know exactly what shot you want to hit or where you want to start the ball and you, before you walk into your shot, and then you go through the same one, two, three things every time. You're going to hit more good shots. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, Wendy, thanks for your time today. We appreciate it. Um, no if, you, if you had anything else you want to expand on, feel free to do so. Uh, that's all the questions I had for you today. I thought they were very informative. Uh, your answers were. And uh, it was a great time. Yeah, cool. We'll see you around. Thanks.